Yesterday, I gave a handyman a list of things that I needed to get done, but he only did the first, third, and the fifth thing on the list. Turns out he only does odd jobs. What's going on, YouTube? Today, we have a fantabulous video for you because it is Mid-Year Mayhem, White Strikes Mayhem, whatever you want to call it, double AP, and we're going to do a video on how to sell off that AP for maximum profit. Probably one of the more difficult things to do in all of ESO because there's so many misconceptions around it and there's so much confusion as to what you should be doing. Should you be going to the golden vendor? Should you be going to the battlegrounds vendor? Should you be buying potions? Should you be buying all sorts of different stuff? And we're going to break that down in today's video because when it comes to turning AP to gold, I've done it for years. This is my favorite ESO event. I'm constantly churning it into gold so that way we can make some more profit. And we're going to talk about the pros and cons of different items as well as different methods uh, to maximize your profits when you're converting AP because likely you have it. You literally got a bunch of it for just logging in. Might as well turn it into a resource that you can use, right? And we're not going to do this in any particular order, but I think this is a great starting point. This is your regional vendor, which is going to be found inside of your merchant house wherever that is in relation to your alliance for me it is here uh, but it will depend based on your alliance obviously blue is the best one here's the perfect epitome of why you always need to be a bit open to what you're going to sell and we're also going to talk about things such as inflation now every single server has different inflation so somebody had put a comment on my last video about the golden vendor that they sold a deadly uh, necklace for 500,000 gold. Well, the rates and things that you're going to be seeing are going to be very different on PC versus console. For example, you're not going to sell that necklace for more than 150,000 gold if you are lucky. You're probably looking at about 80 to 90,000, which means that for, per ratio, that is one gold for every five alliance points. And that is hot garbage. In a perfect world for a uh, console, I like to make close to one alliance point for every one gold. And you might think to yourself, that sounds pretty difficult. And it's not difficult in that everything, there's so many different things that you can buy. When markets for certain things go up and down, you just need to know where to go. And the regional vendor is a perfect example of that. The regional vendor has every base game set zone in the game. For example, this is the Alakir Desert. Don't buy the Alakir Desert. It just happens to alphabetically be at the top. And every single set that drops from there, you could purchase for 5,000 AP, which means that if you started getting sets from there that sold for 5,000 gold or more, you will have made more gold per your AP. Obviously, we're not going to look at the Alakir Desert, but let's look at some zones that actually do have a little bit of, of, of money to them. And we always cover stuff like this on my Market Watch videos because there's times when certain zones are over-farmed, under-farmed. Certain sets might be overutilized due to different things coming out. Uh, Bankrai is a decent example of that because it's pretty heavy. Spriggins is a great PvP intro set. Seventh Legions is a decent one. Something to consider, though, even if you sell these for a couple like 7,000 to 15,000, which is usually about how much I sell set pieces for that are from non base game, you know, non DLC areas, you're still going to every so often get Vampire Lord pieces which are absolutely garbage. That's going to be about one in every three. So you kind of have to take that in stride. And I'm not advocating for this being the best vendor, but it's important to have this in your tool belt because, for example, they might change sets around. For example, I think Stiggins is a great set, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the other sets here are worth it. But if certain pieces of Stiggins start, for whatever reason, selling because they buffed it, you know, for tens of thousands of gold, you know, say, for example, there's a chase item there, which is just an item that's worth significantly more, and the other ones say it's the dual wield for some reason. That means that then, you know, for, if you get a dagger, you get 100,000 gold. So it's more worth it to gamble. So sets like Cold Harbor can be okay in certain situations. Craglorn is another decent one that is underutilized with how good some of its sets are, especially for PvP, because let's not forget, this is a PvP-centric year. The whole Q4 update is a PvP update. So we're very excited to see what that looks like. Uh, Deshaun is another decent one as well because both Plague Doctor and obviously Mother Sorrow are pretty good sets. But the other ones here don't really stand out to me. Uh, and unfortunately, not a whole lot that I would necessarily suggest here. The only other shout that I might give you is Riven Spire's Necropotence can sell for a lot because it's just so under farmed. 
Not many people go questing in Riven Spire. They don't spend a lot of time in Riven Spire. So in situations, I've seen things such as the Necropotence Fire Staff or Resto Staff. You know, I've seen it balloon to as much as 100 to 200,000 gold on console before. That is rare because a lot of people with the sticker book have those items now. But just keep an eye out for sets like that. And then sometimes, you know, places like uh, Stone Falls, for example, Red Mountain does decently well. Uh, and then His Sap and Swamp Raiders is another good shot for Shadowfen. Not the vendor that I think you're going to make the most profit on, but when it comes to just getting cheap items, this is 5,000 alliance points. You're gambling low-level AP to get potentially decent reward. And next, I just wanted to touch briefly on things such as Dawn Prisms. To me, Dawn Prisms are not worth it unless the economy changes a lot. Uh, and the reason for that is just because it's... It just is it worth reselling at the rate that you're going to get. For example, on console, probably going to get like ten to twelve thousand gold. I've sometimes seen it balloon to as much as fifteen, twenty thousand crafting events. People needing to use them for one reason or another. If in those situations, maybe because they're pretty easy, you can put them in your craft bag, which definitely helps. Because if you had to buy, you know, that the last vendor we were at, you know. 5,000 a piece if you wanted to throw a million, you know, <laughs> AP into it. I mean, that's like, what, 200 slots of inventory space that you have to store while it's being sold. So there is some merits to selling things like Dawn Prisms. It's very consistent. They sell quickly, but it's not something you're going to make a good return on. But notably, notably, it is a higher return rate than if you were to buy items, usually from the golden vendor. Now, this vendor right here next to it is interesting because you actually will see that all of these sets that you can purchase for cheaper in the outside towns, and for those of you who might be confused what I'm talking about, every single one of these towns, you might think they offer no strategic importance, and realistically, they really don't. But if you have this town, you can access a vendor there that sells you really good sets for 12,000 alliance points a pop, which is a good deal. Here, though, you could buy those same sets for 20000 a pop, which makes it certainly interesting. Is it better to save yourself the time and the struggle? No, it's not. Go save yourself 8,000 alliance points. If you were to buy 100, of just to say you're buying Affliction, it's a big difference based on whether you're paying 20000 or 12000 But if you're trying to just roll some low-level AP and you don't want to be bothered with it, don't worry about it. But don't forget, you can put alliance points in the bank. Like, for example... You got a red character, you can just log into a red character, fast travel over there and put it all in. So don't stress yourself out about that. But it's a good way to highlight some sets here that I think are pretty decent to purchase. I think Affliction, and again, we do cover this in our weekly, uh, or excuse me, our monthly Market Watch videos. Affliction is a pretty decent one here. Potentates is a decent one, but it's a bit of a gamble because people generally only want a few chase items. Buffer of the Swift is another one that sells decently well just because a lot of people don't resell it. And you might notice that trend, you know, for example, I don't think Curse Eater is really anything to write home about, but because not many people sell it, if you're the only one selling it, you can ask for pretty decent premiums on it. Same with Dark Convergence. Dark Convergence doesn't get sold a whole lot more, especially except for the jewelry pieces. So if you're selling body pieces, weapons and whatnot, you can usually make a decent chunk of money because people see the clips online. Oh my gosh, they just sucked a thousand people into a black hole. I want to go do that. They go out and buy the set, then they probably hate it because I hate Dark Convergence. Deadly Strike, perfect example of a great set that you can purchase. This one actually comes from Bruma, which is the town that we just looked at. It's one of the best in slot sets in the games. It's been very consistent throughout the years. It's what I generally dump most of my alliance points into because of its consistency. Also, don't be fooled at the top where it says bind on pickup. You open the container, then you can sell the con you can actually sell the item from there. So say for example, you get the best item buy this you get uh, the deadly dagger boom you just made 200,000 gold on console from 12,000 AP now this is 20,000 because we're not at Bruma pretend we're at Bruma you just you just made 10 times your amount of gold you're not going to get that from the golden vendor you're not going to get that from prism uh, runes you're not going to get that from you know any sort of other things that's why I like gambling on these set pieces Elfbane another perfect example the fire staff sells for a lot of money too, 100 to 200,000 gold, depending on uh, how many people are looking for it based on how many are listed, which is a great interjection here. How do you know which set to focus on? I've just given you Deadly, I've given you Elfbane, we've looked at some others. We'll talk about it a bit later, but it's really just as simple as just go to the major towns, go to Vivek City, Mornhold, go to Wayrest, go to Elden Root, 
and just see how many listings there are of certain sets. And then you'll then have an idea of which ones are underlisted because a perfect example of this is, right, so me and my friend wanted to make uh, really easy, cheap PVP sets, right? And so I was going to set them up with Crafty Alfique. The entirety of Mournhold, the full, the biggest trade center, the entirety of console, zero listings, which meant, in my mind, I should just go grind this set and start listing it. We went to other towns and other places and eventually purchased it, but I was like, there's a deficit in this market here, because remember, you can only have at max 500 people. Those 500 people can only have a certain amount of listings, 30. So at any moment, there's different gaps and things on that market. And it doesn't, and it almost regulates itself kind of naturally and then unnaturally at the same time. What do I mean by that? What I mean is, is that people like me will notice what's missing and start selling it. But also the unnatural piece is, is that, you know, you never know who's going to come through and buy a whole bunch of something because they're like, you know what? I really want this set, even though it's a bit more niche. So it can be tricky, but it can also be easy from that aspect as well. Going down the list. Uh, Harothgar's chill, I think, is just crying out for a buff. I just wish it was so much better. This set does sell decently well. I've seen a lot of people recommend it on YouTube videos. So sometimes it's not necessarily whether a set's good. It's just people recommend it. Rally and Cry, great one to use. Plague Break, another great one to use. Definitely check those two out as well. Transmutation is another really good set as well. You'll see it highly recommended on a lot of like written guides and whatnot. Again, this is not me necessarily telling you that, oh, if you guys want an easy PvP set, go buy Transmutation. Not what this video is focused on. To me, whether or not something is good or not doesn't make a difference. It's, a, it's like me saying, like, oh, I don't like Louis Vuitton. Therefore, you know, if you see one out on the street for a good deal, you know, don't buy it, you know, because it's worth, you know, you could resell it or whatever. My personal opinion of Louis Vuitton has nothing to do on whether or not a set is going to make you money or not. And that's really the primary focus of this. But I would be willing to do more videos if you're interested in more cheap PvP build setups. But I do have a video on that as well, uh, where I focus a lot on crafted sets, sets that you get really good introduction-wise. And that kind of will round off this area here. Um, it's, it's sets like Juggernaut, Morog, Tong, Vicious Death, I think are good. A bit on the uh, the outskirts here. Um, but one more actual final shout I'll give you. Here you are at. Uh, I think it's actually pretty decent. Uh, it's one of the only good three-piece sets in the game that stacks pretty well. Uh, with the mark and ring which is highly underutilized and i think as pvp becomes really good this year with q4 hopefully we'll see a lot of more mark and ring builds and here be where the golden vendor sits now the golden vendor has taken a huge fall from grace i covered it in my yesterday's golden vendor video but let's talk a little bit more about why the jewelry crafting changes have completely decimated the ability to just easily use the golden vendor to make gold so if you wanted to use the Golden Vendor, what are some situations and things to look out for? As somebody who personally loves the Golden Vendor, look out for sets like Pariah. Why is Pariah such a good necklace or ring to look out for? And well, while I pull it up here, place your guesses in the comments below. It's because there's no dragons, dolmens, there's no harrow storms, which means to get jewelry from that zone, you have to actually get it from a chest. So generally the rings of Pariah are already worth hundreds of thousands of gold and it's our which means that it's generally worth the investment to buy that then in gold because not only are you saving jewelry upgrade mats but you're also saving yourself from buying something that's purple and expensive there's not that many zones like this though another notable example though is vardenfeld you know Molag ball was like we can't mess around here so um we can't uh can't invade this bad boy probably because vivek was there which you know makes sense so when it comes to that, look out for sets that are just naturally hard to get as is. Rings specifically, uh, although necklaces generally do fairly well as well. But remember, you need to wear two rings. You only need to wear one necklace. So you've got ten fingers. But that's why the Golden Vendor has taken such a fall from grace. Even when they made it cheaper, jewelry mats are just significantly cheaper. Eight times cheaper almost. And because of that, that gap that we see... It's just too wide to be able to fill to make profit of most sets. Now, some benefits of the Golden Vendor is that while I have given you examples of how you could easily buy and roll for hundreds of Plague Break items, you know, with half a million AP, that's 100 items that you got to sell, even though you're going to make tons more gold, because that means that essentially if you put, you know, 500,000 AP into it, you'll probably make over 
half a million gold on console and probably around 2 million gold on PC, you still have to use all of those slots and you're going to have to be in a guild trader to move that much inventory. You're not going to be selling that in zone chat by any means. But if you do have golden items, you can stock up on those and you can sell them significantly easier. You can try to sell them in zone chat or you're not wasting as many guild trader slots as you would be if you're trying to move millions of alliance points. And to round us off, let's talk about Battlegrounds vendors. A lot of people don't really even focus on these bad boys, and that might be for good or bad reasons. Generally, motif chapters, not worth reselling. But this is where it gets a little interesting. So, Alliance Point Spell Drops. These bad boys have a decent utilization and endgame content for different types of things, so these will resell pretty well. However, here's the problem, is that generally, at best, you're going to make half of your gold back and on PC, which somebody's going to be screaming and saying, but on PC, we can sell these for so much more. Yes, but it's all in relations. For example, on PC, Deadly Strike sells for four to five times more than it does on console. Therefore, you still need your Alliance spell drops to sell for the exact same amount more to even be competitive, which they don't. So that's where this becomes tricky to explain this to multiple platforms where the economies exist in a microcosm. But... Let's talk about situations when these bad boys generally do become a little bit more valuable to sell and potentially something you could stock up on to resell because they do stack fairly well. And, you know, per gold, you know, for a full stack, they're not too shabby. Generally, though, these sell very well around PvE events because you think people are going to be needing these. It's kind of like Perfect Row. Generally on console, Perfect Row will sit at around 10 to 14,000 gold. But in situations where people need things like XP potions or consumables that require it, you know, then that's really going to start skyrocketing almost to 30,000. So it's almost a doubling of your profit, and potentially even a little bit more. So what we're looking at here is a situation where if there's a lot of PvP events going on, think dungeons, trials, people are going out farming arenas or tons of difficult overland content for whatever reasons. These potions can be decent to purchase, but generally are not, in my opinion. It's the same with the Dawn Prism. Every so often, the Dawn Prism market will be barren. But here's the problem. A lot of people have alliance points in the game. So when it's an easy something like that that people notice, they're generally just going to purchase it and put it on the market pretty quickly. Same with these potions here. Because these potions obviously can be made without any sort of alliance points. You can just throw some alchemy re-ingredients together and get these anyway, but it's something to consider. When there's a heavy emphasis on PvE farming, you generally make a decent click of money from these bad boys. But ladies and gentlemen, you survived. We've gotten through the main, easiest ways to get through alliance point selling. It's actually not as complicated as I think people make it out to be. It's generally as simple as just buy a bunch of items and list them on the market. I know that's always a cop-out answer, but there's so many good sets in ESO right now, and because we have a lot of emphasis coming up on PvP, and even there's going to be some, you know, on Daunted Celebration events, there's a really good way to make a lot of gold, because people are going to be making a lot of new characters. We've obviously got this exciting new system coming out, scribing. I think people might be experimenting with different classes, so as people experiment with new classes, new characters, they need new sets. As they level up during these events, they're going to be consumables. Consumables and things, you know, can be used. And so there's all different intricate things and ways to profit off the ESO economy. This is why I always make my monthly videos on how to make money on ESO, as well as going over everything that month as well. Stay tuned for that video for March because it'll be coming out here soon. It goes over a bit of AP selling as well, and you can see my grand spreadsheet. Also, my Discord also has everything that I talked about in its own specific channel, so you can read. All the sets, that way you don't have to rewatch a video, because as much as I would love for you to watch this multiple times, that would be a bit selfish of me. I mean, I feel free to like it, obviously, share it with your friends, but don't feel obligated to watch it multiple times. Head on over to my Discord, and I have listed out everything that's good to purchase with your alliance points, and that you can resell it for gold. Obviously, check the market, see if there's tons of listings of it already, and then you'll know, hey, this is already flooded, or hey, it's empty. Make a lot of gold right now on it. Everyone, thank you guys so much again for watching this video. It's always a pleasure to have you guys here. I always like talking about things that I, you know, just feel like is one of my most asked questions. I feel like I'm actually solving a, the problem that people need answers to, that people want to know. What do I do with all this bad boy, you know, currency? That's what you need to do with it. 
just do all the stuff that we talked about in the video. Thanks, so thank you for sticking around. Uh, we are still doing our three giveaway drawings. All you have to do to be entered is be subscribed. We are so close to 20,000 subscribers. As Patrick Starr could say, I could taste it. Second thing is, is just leave comments on the video. Ask a question at the end of every video, but I will make this easier because this is going to be a long video already. The question is, is what zones do you think are the hardest to get jewelry from? Because I think that'll be a great way for people to come down in the comments below and get an idea of what sets to look out for in the Golden Vendor. So tell people in the comments, what are the most difficult zones for you to get jewelry from? Excited to see your answers. And the third thing is a random gift card code will be flashed upon the screen throughout one of the videos for the month of February. It's going to be coming up very soon as a clue here. Maybe you see the videos in the next uh, couple days, and uh, I'll catch you there. Bye, guys. You better remember to like and subscribe to Jake Clips. Or you should. I might have to pluck your eyes if you don't. Or, better yet, I'll skip rope with your entrails. Do it now. Subscribe. Ta-ta. Off with you.